are now tuned in to the OSINT Curious Podcast. Hi, everybody. Welcome to our weekly podcast, webcast. This is Michael Hoffman from uh, OSINT Curious. I'm joined by a cast of wonderful people with us. Uh, we are going to be uh, continuing to do these weekly webcasts and break them off into podcasts. Kirby has some stuff to talk to us about, about where we're doing our podcasts and where we're hosting that content. So stick with us. We've got a lot to talk about today. First, Let's go around the horn, introduce ourselves, and uh, you know, if you have something to shout out or something to talk about real quick, why don't we do that? Ginsburg, you're up first for me. Uh, Ginsburg5150, you can catch me on Twitter. Uh, you can catch me at uh, <clears throat> OSINT.teams, the uh, Rocket Chats uh, group that was started a while ago and migrated from Slack to this Rocket Chat thing. Um, yeah, that's about it. Cool. Dutch? Hi. Dutch underscore Ozen guy everywhere on the interwebs and just being here for the second time having fun. Awesome. Sector? Sector035 on Twitter and on Medium. Uh, usually information security is my daily uh, normal day job um, but really awesome to be a part of this Ozen family. Cool and rounding out our troop here is Kirby Kerbster. Yeah, you can find me uh, at Curbster on Twitter and at pluses.net. Very cool. Yep. Thank you very much. So uh, how's the week going, everybody? Uh, we had actually our, our another blog post. I'm going to go ahead and share that out real quick. Um, we had another blog post go out this week. This was after GDPR, researching domain name registrations. I heard a lot of really good talk about that. Uh, did anybody want to you know, just uh, mention something about it? Anybody hear anything? It's just me in general getting reactions on um, somebody finally making the effort to post about a topic like this. So credits to Techniset for doing this. Mm -hmm. And I think, especially in Europe, uh, a lot of people appreciated this blog post. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I heard people say, you know, OSINT and GDPR, we have these closed door discussions, these behind the, the private, you know, screens of our, our companies and our, our private group chats. What's happening? Where are the secret resources that we can use that either don't care about GDPR or are still providing us that data that we had pre-GDPR. And I think this being released, uh, this blogcast and any ones that come after it are really sparking that discussion of, of what we can do. And for me, a general call out for people, if you have new sources, which Technicet didn't name in the blog post, please let us know because we're always on the lookout for new useful tools or websites to get that extra info that you might need. Cool. Yeah, I think GDPR is actually going to be a kind of a beneficial thing for OSINT in general. It's not going to be, you know, people kind of sitting on their haunches and, and just doing the basic DNS, you know, IP lookup stuff, whatever. It actually is going to make <clears throat> people get out there and do a little more digging. So these type of uh, tools and tool sets are going to become way more useful in the future. And I, I really do like Pulse Dive. Um, I've used it for a while and I've talked to the guy that started that. Um, so just those, those IOCs and the other, you know, indication of compromise and things like that, that, you know, we're going to go through and kind of see and rely more on in the future, I think are, are just kind of starting to come up. So it's good that people get referenced, you know, kind of how to use them and stuff. Absolutely. And I think those, the resources that are in the blog post, they might change. You know, this is, yeah. this is the nature of OSINT and the internet is what's a great resource today might change tomorrow, might have yeah. restricted content and we keep hopping sources to sources. Totally. Cool. All right. Um, so one of the things I wanted to shift to was news that well, actually before we get to the news uh, from this past week was we had a person submit something on OSINT Curious Forms. Uh, at the bottom of our web pages, we have these wonderful uh, submit us a, well, not on that web page, way to go, Micah. Um, but like here, we have a, uh, um, if you want to, oh, where is it? I always mess this up. Uh, here we go. 
web webcast suggestions. So if you have suggestions or if you have other things that you want to submit to us, you can click there and fill out a little form. We had uh, Jay. He submitted a question that I wanted to throw out to you all and find out what your thoughts are. He says that he's uh, a quick starter, somebody that's that's looking to get into OSINT, and he really wants to understand, is there a certain order to the skill sets that we need to use in OSINT? I guess I'll, I'll take a back up and, and say, what, what are some of those kind of foundational things that you need to know in order to be a good OSINTer? Is, do you have to do these types of things in a certain order? What are your thoughts? Well, an order, um, I think it starts with being eager to learn as much as you can about the subject and maybe not specialize in a certain specific thing within the ocean field. Just read in general, what is it? How can I leverage it? How can I pivot into things? How, can, how do others do it? And keeping track of what I'm doing. I think that's it, basically. An order? No, I wouldn't say an order. No. So I think what you're sp speaking about is that we have um, it is more the personality and things, the personality characteristics of a person. I think what Jay was really asking for is, well, you know, there's Python, then there's people, then there's IPs and domains, ah, there's yeah. all that things like that. Is there like a content area that we we should start out with and then moving forward? Hey, and I want to shout out to uh, Beowulf. Hey. Uh, welcome to the welcome to the uh, webcast, buddy. Hey, fashionably here? late. Yeah, what? Right. yeah, he's here. <laughs> I, I lurked in late. Like, I saw you. As far as like what you should learn first and that sort of thing, I think you know, get comfortable with two things. First of all, Google. You know, you got to get used to you know, learn your Google uh, foo right. Get some of those Google hacking books. Um, figure out how it works. And if you figure out how it works, you get the basics of pretty much any search engine because you're not just going to be using Google. But then I think the second thing is know how to find those other people who know the OSINT tricks, right? Don't be, don't think that, I mean, one, one skill is finding everybody else. Yeah. Who can help you with everything. Yeah. I, I was, I was actually going to kind of echo the same thing. I think uh, like, and we were going to maybe talk a little bit about this too, like Google dorks, Google hacking, so like that or whatever. Um, but also like networking and learning how to research is also, um, I think a thing that needs to be at least looked at, <clears throat> you know, you, you set up with a goal and then you try to work backwards from that goal uh, to, to accomplish what you're trying to go through and search. I think Dutch's uh, medium post is also, pretty pretty spot on or whatever it's it's more of a mindset and to be curious about what you're doing to to follow it all to the logical conclusion but from a technical aspect i think just learning how to go through and search is one of those things that really will help you because even if you don't know python or if you can't do command line if you don't know tools and stuff like that you know there's still a wealth of information that you can get from you know search engines social media um things over so it's it's whatever you're you're getting into and comfortable with and then you know, continuing to be, you know, curious and learn from other people and, you know, setting up those feeds just to go through and get your own stuff, searching your own information so that you know what information is, is going to be able to come back, whatever. Um, starting with a target that you already know is accessible sometimes works as well. Thanks, Ginsburg. Uh, Sector, did you have something to say? Yeah. Um, I think what can be really helpful, especially when someone is new to OSINT, um, get your yoga framework or um, the OSINT framework because it creates a little bit of a visual overview of what you can do when you have certain pieces of information. And especially with the yoga, you can see, okay, where can I, where can I pivot to? If I have a a nickname, what can I find out? And if I find out a real name, what else can I do with that? So, yeah, you're now showing your um, OSINT, uh, your yoga mm -hmm. platform, your, your, your graph. Yeah. Really, really helpful, especially for uh, people just starting out with OSINT. Yeah. Um, hey. yeah go, go ahead, Dutch. Now, I was thinking, um, if you combine this with basically some Golden W rules, uh, first establish your research question and try to answer them by asking yourself who, what, why, where, when, all that kind of stuff. And that's basically how you get 
all answers. Just take those steps. Yeah. And you know, I'm going to, I'm going to respectfully disagree with most of you because why not? Um, <laughs> um, you know, I, so in my career, I found that there is some baseline knowledge that, that you can have. And what I think is you do need to have an understanding of all the different things that are out there. But as far as learning, uh, the background information is so, so helpful. Uh, my suggestion is, is depending upon where, uh, speaking to Jay or whomever's out there, uh, wherever you're doing your research on whatever your targets are, though, that's the type of research that you should start with. So if you're doing people-based research, yeah, you need to understand how to use the people search engines and then it's going to help you get out into social networks. And then what I suggest is, you know, start working through those social networks. And I think uh, Dutch is going to talk about uh, one of those, uh, something that also he found uh, about social networks and, and stuff later on. But, but <coughs> think of it as, I think it was like a tree growing, you know, there's that core stuff that you have and then you can go off to a tree branch, come back to that trunk and, and go off. If you understand core networking, like what an IP address is, domain name, DNS, and other things, you can be extremely uh, successful in understanding what resources are over there in the, the pulse dive for, for IOCs and uh, indicators of compromise and other stuff. But if you're not going to be doing that stuff right away, Focus on what you think you will be doing and learn some of that. You can always come back and then go into these other areas. Anybody want to disagree with me? I wouldn't dare. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'd, I'd back up. Uh, I'd back you up there, Micah. I I feel like um, OSINT in general. Uh, I think of the mindset almost like uh, if you if you go to compete in a capture the flag at like at, a, at one of our conferences, you can bring some baseline tools and, and, you know, other knowledge from previous capture the flags and stuff, but each one's going to be different, you know? So you got to get in there and then kind of mirrors what Ginsburg says. You got to know how to go and research something. And sometimes you got to know how to go and research something quickly on the fly, you know, cause you, you don't have a whole lot of time. You got, you know, a case deadline or just, you know, a, a target that's maybe, you know, likely to, to bolt on your, or, you know, kill their profiles. Um, so bring as much as you can, but, be willing to, to learn and specialize on what's in front of you for sure. Yeah, kind of like micro specializing, you know, the, the, the time frame, whatever, which you have to go through and complete that, you know, you could do a real deep dive, but maybe only have four hours or two weeks or whatever it is, whatever. So <clears throat> it is kind of on the flat for a lot of stuff. And like Mike is saying, you know, there's always new tools. There's always new information. The internet's a wild place. So you're always going to find something different. Um, that's going to come at you there. So kind of being on your toes in regards to that stuff is, is definitely a skill set that I think is, is something you should look into. But, yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks, everybody. Um, any last thoughts on that? All right. Jay, I hope that answers your question. And if you have any questions for us that you want us to answer here on the webcast, uh, I'll put a link in the video uh, comments here on YouTube where you can submit that or you can visit our OSIN Curious webpage. Also the Twitter, right? Also the Twitter. Yeah, you can submit these to us via the OSINT Curious uh, Twitter uh, Twitter account, and or hit any one of us up and say, "Hey, could you talk about this on the on the yeah. podcast?" We're happy to happy to oblige. Okay, well, let's go ahead and move into a segment I like to call Week in Review because, well. Let's. I know we need like a and now you know thing. Flash screen. Yeah, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna make it up. Good. good. Um. So. Uh, Start. Before, yeah. Exactly. Right. So uh, for this segment, um, I want to go ahead and share my my Google Chrome. And the first thing I wanted to do was go to a site that I uh, made. It's called YouTube. I don't know if you've heard of this. You made YouTube? Yeah, you know. Awesome. Um, so just so you know, we have this OSINT Curious uh, web, uh, this YouTube page, and uh, we're going to be uploading all of our webcasts and podcasts there. So this is last week's podcast, webcast, uh, and uh, go there and catch up on what you missed. 
All right, so what I'm gonna do is, uh, we have each submitted some things that we wanted to talk about. I'm gonna pick a tab from random, randomly here in my Google Chrome browser, and let's talk about it. I think, Dog, this was you. Nope, it was, this was Sector, I think. Sector? I have no clue what it is. This, this no, is a was... wild story, though. Go yeah, ahead. absolutely, absolutely. This is indeed a wild story. Um, Chloe Condon found out um, that someone was um, tweeting this photo of her and complaining that um, this woman on this photo was uh, being following this guy after a talk. And she all of a sudden she found out, or someone tipped her off, I'm not sure, and she goes like, well, this is a photo of three years ago. This is not something recent. This is somewhere I was, this is some event or conference I was in. So what do you mean this happened just now and I was following someone? This is weird. So um, she and, and other people online started looking into this and this turned out into one heck of a little, yeah, OSINT witch hunt, so to say. People found out that there was this guy, and for years and years, he has created um, Instagram, um, Twitter, uh, or tweets, and everything. Everything was fake. He picked photos from advertisements and used them to boast whatever he was trying to convince people he was. And he has been doing that for years and years, and all of a sudden, this Chloe... Um, Chloe was, um, yeah, found out about this and people started looking into this. This guy now has said, oh, I'm sorry, someone hacked my profile. Mm -hmm. uh, someone has been tweeting some silly stuff. He deleted everything online. So that's one idiot gone from the internet and right. nobody has any idea what has been going on and why he did this. Interesting. So, so I think the OSINT connection that you, you made in a, a private chat was that to figure out what all the different personas he has are and to, to do the photo analysis of, hey, this picture was from three years ago when she was in a wine tasting in, in like an underground cask room and stuff like that. Um, there was a whole bunch of OSINT that they did uh, to, to discover all this about this person. Is that right? Yes, indeed. They used um, Google refers image searches or TinEye um, to look up photos and coming up with just plain advertisements that he cropped in such a way that he could use it to sell some kind of story in, in a tweet or on Instagram. Mm. So, yeah, a lot of people just in their spare time, they just took the time to look up what was going on here. And I, I don't think anybody knows at the moment why he did it um, he, he deleted all his tweets his account is empty too so who this uh, guy was why he was doing it i think it will stay a mystery all right there, was I there don't know no how much of a mystery this is going to stay because it sounds like there's people who know him in real life if you go through that thread and they said that this is this is just the beginning of the, the story with this guy now i don't mm. know who he is and i only know about it from this thread but he seems to have been doing this in the past, even though he says, you know, this, hey, somebody just recently hacked me. So you think he'll be back, Kirby? Oh, I don't, uh, you know, if you look through that thread, you can, there's some com comments that say that he's already back. He may have gotten rid of that account, but that maybe there's two other accounts. I don't know. So right. interesting, something to follow, something to watch. Definitely. Mm. All right. Dutch, I think this was you, uh, a, a tool that just was, just popped onto Twitter today, right? Yeah, um, and I haven't actually got a time to really play with it. I just clicked on it because I click shit sometimes. You're so and curious. <laughs> so curious. But uh, it looked really interesting. It reminded me to a similar tool called uh, Yasif for YouTube. Does the same thing in a way. You give it a word, um, and it will look for connecting words or just like a social network analysis with a centrality uh, based on eigenfactor, I think. Uh, it's a, it's sure, a I need to inv investigate Jakar. a little bit more. 
It says Jacquard similarity between uh, the shared set of users. So if you and I are both in two different Reddits, uh, because we're in two different Reddits and because we're both in uh, a Reddit together, then it might think, hey, these Reddits are, are similar. I think no. I'm not <laughs> familiar with uh, Captain Picard, uh, Jacquard uh, type of things. Kirby? Yeah, I would say that uh, I love the idea of this because one of the main things that I use, like Reddit Investigator or Snoop Snoo or the Reddit Analyzer tool, is to find other Reddits. Maybe I'm not looking for a specific person, but I say, okay, this person's really into, you know, this type of a topic, so I'll you put them in Reddit Analyzer and just to see what other subreddits they're in, just because I'm looking for the subreddits, and this looks like a much easier thing to find that kind of content. I think one of the challenges here is just the sheer overwhelmingness of it. Uh, you know, there are there some, and uh, I'll go ahead and do this. Um, I was playing around with this earlier, and uh, there are some other Reddit and Reddits out there. Um, but if you look at this, the the clustering of these subreddits is really, really uh, well defined, right? And you see that on the asshole Reddit and that moves over and all of these people are and people are, are subscribed to that, then there's this mass. But when you when you look at something like just OSINT, it's so busy. I, I, I wonder what the what the real value of this is. Yeah, we need to figure that one out. Yeah. Yeah. We'll just have to get more granular than just OSINT. Well, yeah, you get more granular, or what we can probably do is take uh, this. This is probably just JavaScript, and we might be able to change the JavaScript, how things are clustered or whatever, um, or, you know, talk to um, this guy, Andre, um, and see if uh, we, we can go ahead and do a PR to this uh, GitHub page. Yeah. yeah. So does it only search topics? It's not uh, for usernames and things like that? We'll, we'll, we'll search that? Uh, it, I don't think it it does that. Let's see. Uh, anybody want to give me their anybody? Wanna? I was going to say, what's, what's Dutch's? <laughs> I was, uh, uh, yeah, I'm <laughs> just like I said, I just dropped this here and I'm trying to read up on it now, but I just yeah, need go. to come back on it. All right. It so that's just, my buddy, Rob Fuller, Mubix. Uh, I don't think it's actually doing. Oh, so there's you, Mubix. Um, but this is not a. I, from what I see, this is this is the subreddits and stuff. So it's it really Agreed. doesn't need an yeah. R. I just didn't know. I thought I'd make you play with it. Yeah, that's cool. All right, and that's available here. Uh, as always, we're going to collect all these links and then put them in the in the comments in the blog post that's associated with this webcast. So that's pretty cool. I wonder if that's. Um, Something they can duplicate and use for other websites, whatever. I wonder if there's a, a way to go through and use it, the same visualization, whatever, for, you know, for, well, I don't want to say for Twitter or something, because that would be a nightmare. But, you know, Reddit is a very, very specific use case for a lot of that stuff. I, I think, and I know back, I don't know, it was like a year or two ago, Dutch, like we were talking about like um, dark market um, things on like the Slack, you know, and I know that a lot of this stuff, um, that we were looking at, whatever kind of forward-facing stuff, whatever was was coming from Reddit, which was nice. Um, it was the but, darknet market snoops, the, the the vendors reviewing each other, and, yep, and you know, yep. the explanation on how to use the darknet as safe as possible and how to buy as covert as possible. Really good stuff on there. Also, the shutdowns and stuff when when um, you know when they came in, and they started you know seizing websites and stuff like that or whatever i think a lot of those posts went up to to warn other people whoever hey stay away or this has been infiltrated for the last three months or whatever so, so it could be interesting to use this tool to find and target those reddits and subreddits which gets your interest yep right, i think, I think it's that's really a good looking use. it's looking at the users right so if you have people that are interested that are on this subreddit you know where else are they talking that that's actually pretty cool yeah Yep, I think that'd be a good idea. Um, but I, I think that was one thing that uh, did lead to a lot of uh, searches and stuff as well, is because people, you know, with this password reuse and username reuse, whatever, there was a lot of OSINT that you could get from usernames that you got from the dark market, um, you know, subreddits and stuff like that, and then transfer them over to other forums, um, you know, cryptocurrency things, um, sometimes Twitter, but not, you know, a lot. But yeah, there was. There's other ways to go through and pivot out of that. So it was, it was kind of neat. Uh, I got to say something more about this tool because the data is only from August and September of 2018. 
still 38 million user subreddit records, but it's it's a little data set. Uh, yeah. So it's static data. Yeah. Okay. That's what I get from it now. So. Okay. But I like the IG. I, I I'm a visual guy. I like when it's when things get mapped and get like social network analysis way of visualizing things. It makes me sift quickly through data. <clears throat> yeah. And I do have a question. This is, I'm sorry, it's kind of off topic. Of whatever. Has anybody ever used a tool? And it's a it's a data warehouse tool we called JasperSoft. Has anybody ever used that in database kind of hosting or anything? Never even no. heard of it. So that's yeah. good. I'm, I might do something with it later. Or whatever. I think they have a community edition that's free. It is like it basically is a a, a warehouse setup for like data lake, data warehouse, whatever buzzword you want to go through and use. But as people are continuing to go through and you have that breach dumps or, you know, password information or Twitter handles or whatever it is, whatever, you know, this is something where like self hosting, even putting it in um, digital ocean or something like that or whatever uh, may be. And it does a lot of the visualization um, after you collect the data and stuff. So it is something that looks pretty. I just, I'm not sure how it all works yet. So I'm still playing with it. Cool. All right. Let's move on. Let's move on to ouch. Yeah. Nico, looking yeah. at this. Uh, yeah. So Nico was in, actually you were the guest editor. Is that right? Yeah. Um, it was all because I went to uh, the Sound Security Awareness Summit in London. It was back in November, and Lance Spitzner from Sounds he asked me to uh, go on stage there and tell them to the to the audience where on what subjects you can use OSINT for security awareness. Um, and from that, he said maybe it would be interesting to do something new because on the Security Awareness Summit, normally it's just a lecture or just an hour of someone talking. And there it was the first time I gave a workshop. So the whole audience got to OSINT themselves after my presentation. And this is basically a summary of that and an end result of that. And that's new for the OUCH newsletter also, I think. It's the first time you, they get, they try and get people to get actively involved and investigate and look at their cells. So, I think this yeah. is a, a terrific foray into the OSINT. Isn't just for professionals that are looking for terrorists or trying to no. uh, look at you know competitive intelligence for businesses. OSINT is really for everybody, and it's the way that we as private citizens try to keep our stuff private. If you can't run a couple of queries, and I think uh, correct me if I'm wrong, wasn't uh, Henry? Henry, Henry, didn't he post something on Twitter that, that was like, how many times do you Google yourself and how many different formats of, of name? Uh, Henry Van Eck, I think. Um, he, oh. I, I think he oh, tweeted yeah. out something um, that said, you know, do you do first initial last name, last initial first name, and you know, Kirby? But don't you mean Hank, Hank Van Ness? Yeah, Hank Hank. Van Ness. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's what I was going to say too. But also, uh, why not just set them all up as RSS? <laughs> yeah. Mm, interesting. You know, I'm going to have to have you do that RSS thing and, and show Yeah, it's a neat trick. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so maybe next week on the next um, uh, webcast, I'll do a demo of all the ego searches that I do for myself and how I set them up so that anytime somebody mentions me online, I don't necessarily reply to everybody who mentions me online, but I know about it. All right, so everybody out there listening to this, your goal for the next week is to mention Kirby as much as possible in as many different mediums. That way we'll be able to find a whole bunch of stuff for next week's webcast. Yeah. <laughs> no, please do not. <laughs> You'll make me go into a cave and, and cut off all media. <laughs> cool. Well, and, and one other thing that I like about this, and then you know, anybody else can talk, is, is again, it's taking something that people typically might think of as complicated and just explaining the methodology and explaining how they can do it to protect themselves. Because as people's privacy increases, the ability to find stuff about them decreases. Yeah. And my initial idea here was also um, just for those people who don't do this on a day-to-day -day basis, just make them aware of in just a half an hour of basic Googling or search engine typing first name, last name, how much interesting and valuable information one can 
together and game and do evil with or stalk with or that kind of stuff. So, and what what got my most impression is this newsletter. It gets translated in like twenty or thirty different languages. So, I thought it was really cool to reach an audience who was not my native Dutch speaking or English because that's basically the only na- languages I know. So to reach so many people and make them aware of the dangers. Yeah, I thought it was really cool. Kirby? You know, um, you're, you're making people aware of the dangers is one thing, but it's also, this is something that marketers also need to know and people who have small businesses. So even say you're starting a small OSINT business and you want to know who's spreading your word for you, you know, who's your thousand fans. So I don't always say it's a bad thing you find a bunch of stuff. Sometimes you want to find people helping share your message and subscribing yourself to RSS feeds about it or doing all of these tricks to kind of find all that information about it is going to help you, you know, see what your return on investment is, see where your people are, that kind of stuff as well. So it's not only a privacy problem. Yeah, it's understanding about what's happening on the internet that you're interested in, right? Absolutely. Yeah, sometimes half the uh, value in, in doing that kind of stuff is figuring out how to filter out the noise of things that aren't related to you. Um, you know, I, I do simple Google alerts on my real name, um, set that up many years ago. And at the time, there was a college football player going in the NFL. So everything was related to him, especially when he pe- got picked up for like a marijuana and gun charge. You know, all the headlines were, you know, Josh Huff did this, um, which is great for, you know, cover. Um but as I refined that to cut it back down, I started to actually pick up like random people with my name and the, these, you know, different headlines, um, people at like a, a gun protest, you know, or, uh, you know, something else in the news. And recently I had one that, you know, somebody had died in a motor died, accident. Yeah. Yep, I was gone or from a motorcycle accident. So you, you can pick up some pretty interesting stuff just, you know, in observation mode there. Well, and you know, I always think about it the other way around too. Is uh, for the longest time there was uh, a Mike, uh, there still is a Michael Hoffman that's a wrestler. He was a high school wrestler, a college wrestler, and so I was like, oh man, you know, all my 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 ego searches, as Kirby mentions, uh, had to do. I had to put a dash wrestling or you know, dash wrestle, dash state champion to, to start removing his stuff. And I always wonder if he's doing the same searches, going, "Damn it, uh, dash cyber, dash OSINT, and removing all of my stuff that's there. That other Kirby has another problem with me too. Yeah. <laughs> no, there is no other Kirby pluses. <laughs> there will be after this webcast. Oh, maybe. <laughs> Make another Kirby. Cool. All right. Well, um, thanks for uh, for doing that, uh, Dutch. Let's go ahead over here to this one, which was Ginsburg. Ginsburg, so, while you do it, I'm going to play it. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So I know, um, and I'm not as good at the uh, geolocating quizzes. I know quiz time sector. Um, this actually, this tool was tool, game, whatever it is. This was actually introduced by Justin Nordeen. He tweeted this out and said, hey, if you want to practice your geolocating skill set, stuff like that or whatever, go get this. So I got this off his Twitter feed. I thought this was a really cool way to go through and to, you know, at least practice um, your geolocation skill stuff after, you know, or if you want to get more into like the the quiz time stuff, or even just for true OSINT, um, if you're trying to go through and determine a picture and try to determine the date and time. I know there was a blog post that went up about this and SunCalc and some of the other stuff. Um, So this is just one of those fun things that you can can use in your spare time to get a little bit more uh, in depth into, you know, geolocating in, 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 in a fun way. So Oh, this is kind of cool. Let's see. So, so the idea is that they put you in a random place uh, using Google Street View, and then you go ahead and guess where it is, and then they tell you how good or how bad you are. Dixie right. National Forest is in Utah? Come on. I don't know. That's- but they do give you some hints, um, and the score is based upon, you know, the ability to go through and do it without hints and, uh, you know, what what you need to go through and complete it and stuff. So – um, there, there's some fun stuff in there and it's kind of worldwide, um, you know, wherever Google is, is allowed to go through and do their street view, um, you know, rocketeering and all that. So yeah. 
Exactly. Well, and the other thing that I like, and in, in, in we talk about this uh, in OSINT all the time, is that the privacy filters that have that are on things like Google Street View, you know, to wipe out license plates, to wipe out other things, are, are sometimes de delivered haphazardly, uh, mm -hmm. seemingly. For instance, here's a sign right now. If I zoom in on it, we can see it's uh, Bellarizzi. I'm going to mess up that. Bellarizzi, Zonti, whatever. But I bet if I go one step further and that, oh, that was too much here. If I go a little closer, Oh, well, let's go around the other side. Um, it'll be blurred out. Well, see, it's all blurred out now. <laughs> um, but sometimes we actually do have the filtering going on there. So it, it's kind of neat to to find those glitches in the matrix, if you will, where you yeah. can um, you can find stuff, uh, and that allows you to sometimes get other information. Kirby. Yeah, I wanted to um, say what the name of this is for our audio only people who are listening to this on podcast because they've been hearing a lot about this and have no idea what it is. So this is geoguesser.com slash world slash play and geoguesser.com is spelled G-E-O-G-U-E-S-S-R.com slash world slash play. All right, let's see. So I, I just want to ask that if we have like some of the video things, we should probably um, say where they are and also describe them a little bit more for <clears throat> the audio only people makes total sense yeah yeah let's see where ah oh, i was so close i was ten thousand kilometers away oh, all right you got six idea. points I, I did i got six points good job yeah yeah all right so uh let's move on to hate mail who was talking who wanted to talk about this uh I'm that who wants to you can you know, I, i'm just sick and tired of hate mail I just yeah. want friendly mail. Oh, okay, sorry. Carry I on. told you I'm not going to stop giving that to you. I told you, you know, a long time ago. Uh, yeah. uh, this this came up, I think, this last week, and it's a it's a different reconnaissance tool for emails and for passwords. Uh, it looks like it does kind of same things from some of the same uh, tool sets we, we use, um, <clears throat> but um, it does have, I think, a lot of the APIs already kind of built in for this stuff. So, um, you know, it's got, I think it's um, have I been pwned. It's got, uh, what was the other stuff? Shodan and stuff. Yeah. yeah. So uh, just, again, going back to what Kirby said, this is on github.com slash khast3x slash h8 mail. Back to you, yeah. Uh Yeah, I mean, that's – uh, yeah, th those are the services, Shodan, Hunter, Hunter.io, um, you know, the, the public plus there. So maybe this is actually is something you got to build out the APIs for. Uh, Weekly, we leak info, snubs base. Um, so it's, it's just a, another tool, whatever, that, that's out there that kind of does some of the same things as Recon NG, some of the other tools in Buscador and stuff like that. So it's just uh, something that came out this week so people can play with it. I have not done a ton with it. Um, but it does look pretty easy to get up and running. Um, they do have a Docker mode as well, so if you want to go through and put it in a Docker instance, uh, you can go through and do that. Um, so, yeah, it's a little, little shout-out, you know. Cool. Well, and you also mentioned one of the other things, Buscador. Uh, Buscador. V, uh, V2 beta of Buscador came out. Does anybody want to talk about what Buscador is? Um, I think for those who are not in the ocean field, Buscador is an operating system, a virtual machine or virtual box operating system, or even a standalone, um, provided by Intel Techniques, Michael Basel or Basel, what, how you pronounce it. Um, I believe Dave Fit or Dave Westcott contributed uh, to this. He helped build it, and it's basically an all-in-one. OSINT operating system. It provides you with all you need, the basics, the advanced, and the rocket science mode kind of tools. So for everyone in this field, beginner, experienced, or hardcore, I think this is the way to go operating system. Yeah, I think it's it's to OSINT the same thing as what Kali Linux is for penetration testing and cyber -y type of things where everything is pre-installed, pre-configured. You, you download the virtual machine as an OVA file or whatever and then load it into your favorite virtualization technology and you've got a system that's up and running with most of the tools and sometimes 
I think a little bit too many of the tools. I, I mean, I launched, uh, I don't know if it was Firefox or Chrome in there one time. And there, there were so many uh, add-ons and extensions. It was, it was incredible. Uh, but yeah. it, it really lowers the bar. You don't have to be, uh, you don't have to build your own system. You can use this to, uh, to really get a <clears throat> look at, at stuff that's out there. Sector? Yeah, well, one of the greatest things about Buscador is that, uh, especially when you're a beginner, you don't have to spend uh, a lot of time configuring all your tools in your browsers, and you don't have to do um, reconnaissance or, or try to figure out what tools leave a major footprint during uh, an investigation, because some of the tools are pretty intrusive when it comes to gathering uh, information or, or scraping data. So that also helps a lot. Yeah. I think one of the challenges that I would, so one of the other neat things about this is that if you've never dealt with command line tools, launching a terminal window or command line and then typing in uh, everything from how to use Recon G or other things, or even using a tool like the Harvester, they have simplified it in the in Buscador where it's really a lot of the tools are GUI driven. So you press a button, a pop, a blank pops up. It says, what is the IP address you want me to put into the harvester or whatever? And it does the command line configuration for you. So it lowers the barrier to using some of these really good tools. Nico? Yeah. Is, is oh, it, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Now, that's what worries me also, because when you're um, not that experienced yet, I think uh, you need to invest on how tools work in the background, because otherwise you can never explain the results you've gotten, where they come from, or which path you took to get these answers. And that's when you get GUI wrappers around these command line type of tools, uh, you need at least people need to be aware there are things happening on the background. Things maybe get filtered, maybe get sorted in another way than the original results. So at least try and go to the most of the tools here are open source tools. So they have probably have GitHub pages when you look them up, and they will have explanations on how these tools work. So when you're filing reports, then you can explain what you have done. Ginsburg. I uh, was kind of going to echo the same thing. I know that the, a lot of the reason why the GUI and um, some of the bar has been lowered for, for this entry into the Buscador, I know that it's for a wider platform than just like cyber or, you know, DFIR uh, or whatever. Uh, I, I know that this is going to be pointed at a lot of investigators, private investigators, maybe people who don't have a lot of, uh, understanding of how these tools work. I think this is uh, another area that Basil and them are trying to get into. Um, so, yeah, I was going to say kind of the same thing. It's difficult when you have something that is this low barrier to entry, but you don't understand how the tool is really playing in the background. So it, it, it's, it, it's a good thing to go through and have, and I think it's a really nice platform to, to have a baseline for. Buscador is something I, I like to use a lot, and I've added on to it since. Um, but it's one of those things that if you don't know where the information is coming from or if you are searching a generic uh, person identification stuff, you know, just doing, you know, Bob Smith, but not actually finding out if it's the right Bob Smith and then continuing down that rabbit hole, whatever, getting bad intel in regards to that stuff can, you know, ruin um, reports and investigations and stuff. So it's very, very important to, to know what the tools you're using and not just bumble around with them, especially if you're going to be using them for like an official capacity. So. All right. So, uh, 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 sector. And that is why verification is so important. Yeah, you um, like we we talked about last time, I believe that you can do all the data gathering you want, but if you're not analyzing that data to figure out what it means and whether it's relevant and whether it's false positive, whether the wrong Josh Huff died, then you need to really uh, uh, reconsider your process. So. Um, once again, this is intelltechniques.com slash buscador, B-U-S-C-A-D-O-R. All right, let's take a look at this one. I think, uh, Nico, you said something uh, from OSINT.team was posted, right? And somebody had a question about, oh, no, this was, uh, 
Whoop, nope, yep. I'm getting that mixed up. So this was a, a blog post that was by uh, Justin Seitz on tenacity, how to uh, stick with an investigation, right? And you were saying that this kind of relates back to that question from Jay. Yeah, um, well, in the way of um, you can have all the tools. People could, could have teach you all the tricks there are, uh, all the books you could have been, you've read about OSINT, but still, if you don't have that tenacity, which Justin describes in this blog post, um, you're not doing, you're not being the best OSINT investigator that you can be. You have to be eager. You have to bite like a pit bull and don't let go. Um, yeah. But sometimes you need to know when to let go. And that's also part of tenacity. You bite in one piece, mm, you hit the bone, and you can go to the next piece. That's strange. <laughs> We're sorry for uh, offending all you vegans out there. Yes, uh, way to go, Dutch. Man. Uh, but, your, but your point is well taken. Uh, I, I think if we were to use other words, we might call that like being curious, right? No, I mean, but, but there, is, there, are, there are different personality traits that help you accelerate uh, your open source intelligence research. Being curious and clicking shit is definitely one of the things. But also, you know, finding that path, finding that trail. I like to say that, you know, being, being curious about, I wonder what would happen if, I wonder what would if, and, and kind of pull in that thread. It, tenacity is following that. It, it's, it's that having that dedication to, to follow it through. And uh, yeah, I definitely think this is a, and this, this blog post is on uh, Justin Seitz is actually hunchleymedium.com. So it's medium.com slash at hunchley, H-U-N-C-H. L Y and it's the OSINT tenacity Hunchley blog post. Cool. Any other things about that? That was just going back to our earlier conversation. Yeah. All right. Somebody want to talk about this stuff here, this uh, <clears throat> kind of capture the flag ish thing. Yes. So um, in the infosec community, wherever there's been, a lot of talk because there was a tool that came out from somebody, or I'm sorry, even before that, their, their Chromecast, uh, the Google Chromecast, uh, it was, there was a, a universal plug and play feature that was uh, found to be somewhat vulnerable. Um, there was a Twitter personality or something like that that started popping everybody and putting PewDiePie uh, videos up and stuff like that. However, uh, shout out to Thug Crowd because they actually did this like five months ago and nobody picked it up, but this guy got it a little bit more popularized. So uh, this on here, Dan Tintler, uh, is one of the guys who is synonymous for finding shit on the internet <clears throat> via Shodan. And uh, he found uh, there was a Chromecast that was plugged into an office building via a Vizio TV and he did a little capture the flag on here, whatever, gave out the, the, the IP address. And so there's four things on here, whatever, if you can go through and find them that made me laugh, whatever, you know, just this is what it is. And, you know, the first one was that, you know, it was popped by this person over Hacker Girl, which is cool. Uh, the second one, yeah, you can see the Hacker Girl OX or Hacker Girl X. Um, it, it, it gave, Shodan gives an amazing amount of information in regards to this stuff. Uh, it also gave... The uh, internal IP address that it was uh, attached to, um, meaning that it was plugged in on not a guest's, but actually probably their network infrastructure. Uh, it was also, um, oh, there was some other, there was a MAC address for the TV, whatever, so that, you know, there, there was some, some compromisable stuff on there. Uh, yeah, it gave the, uh, the SSID, whatever, so, yeah, the MAC ID and the Wi-Fi that it was on. Um, this... This really was, oh, and then, yeah, kind of uh, on Wiggle showed exactly where this location was, uh, showed who owned it. Uh, it was a Verizon Fios network, wherever that was for a business. Uh, you get a lot of information just from, you know, th this little plug and play device, whatever that you're using for either mirroring to an image or casting, whatever it is, you know, th there's, there's a ton of, of, information and pivotable actionable information just from this one little device. So uh, this came out, I think it was a couple days ago, but this was just a fun little thing that uh, the Viz found and was like, Hey, check this out. You know, 
So there's privacy implications here. It's one of the, the takeaways is that putting these devices, whether they're IoT-ish or whether they're business functionality into your environments without securing them, without understanding what they do and what they send out and how they're reachable can be very, very um, damaging to your business. And to Absolutely. You. Yep. Yeah, just not knowing what's out there. And it's silly to say from like an OSINT perspective, well, if you don't know what's out there, it can really hurt you. But at the same time, if you are, you know, if you're plugging in these devices, whatever, and, and you're not monitoring their well-being, uh, your network's well-being, you know, um, things like that, for a for a consumer, for a, a private individual, yeah, that's a little more difficult, but this is being a business. Um, it's one of those things where you look at it and say, you know, how could they let this go? And I know budgets and constraints and time and patches and all that stuff. But um, this was one of those things where it just, you can get so much data from one little thing that it, it really is. Um, it, it's something where you could roll this into a social engineering attack, a network attack, um, you know, it, it really could cause a lot for, for something that's, that's maybe not worth it. I don't know. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks Ginsburg. Thanks Vis. There you go. And we'll, uh, we'll give you the link to that, uh, that Twitter, uh, conversation in the notes. Yep. All right. Somebody had a, something on Kadio, right? Ah, uh, there we go. Hang on, Josh, you still with us? I think, I think yeah. he's gone. No, he's oh, he's been. Oh, I'm sorry. Back from back from the dead, so to speak. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, Kate O'Neill had something on her uh, Twitter feed there that that is talking about one of the trends that's on Facebook right now is, is people posting kind of like a, a ten year gap of you know how have I aged, so to speak, and putting up, you know, a cur current profile picture and then one from, you know, 10 or more years ago. Um, and I saw this on, on Twitter, jumped over to Facebook and looked. And sure enough, I had, you know, several people in my feed that were, were doing this. And her, her caution is, you know, hey, 10 years ago, I probably would have done this. Right now, you know, with all the data mining and facial recognition stuff going on, you know, we should probably be careful, right? And it, it opened up a decent little floodgate of conversation there. Um, so I definitely thought this was interesting from a, a privacy perspective and knowing what we feel about, you know, all the data that Facebook gobbles up about us. So, you know, wh what's your guys' thoughts on this? Well, Facebook always seems to scare me uh, because I also wanted to point out the similar kind of tweet, Facebook tracking you by, um, um, basically tracking your mouse activity is the same thing. I, I am, and <laughs> they want to know everything about us, but when you want to know something about them, they're not home or the doors are closed, but they track you wherever they can, how they can, and how invasive they can, in my, in my opinion. And yeah, it's a choice when you join Facebook, but still, it's so intrusive. Well, and, and I think the one of the messages that I try to get out to the people that um, <laughs> one of the things that I try to get out to thanks Kirby um, the to the people that I care about is is that you have to think about every single thing that you tweet or post into social media because it, whereas you might not understand why answering questions about what superhero you most resemble or who are the three people that would kill for you if if uh, you got into whatever type of a zombie attack um, there are other people that have ulterior motives. So posting that wonderful, hey, how have you aged in 10 years? Oh, what Kid O'Neill mentions further down is, well, hey, wouldn't this be great to uh, train facial recognition algorithms on age-related characteristics? There's always something that can be done with that stuff that we post, even if you don't understand what it is. So I always like to, to really think twice before posting stuff up there. Yep, agreed. <clears throat> one of the things you guys can find if you download your Facebook archive is you will actually get your facial uh, recognition algorithm data uh, sent to you, um, which I, I always found interesting. Um, I tried to take that and figure things out with it. And I think I got as far as finding a couple of white papers um, with some of the uh, Facebook analysts talking about it, um, but it gets fairly complex. And I think uh, it, it kind of goes 
above a lot of people's heads at that point. But you can definitely see what your what your face looks like to Facebook if you go download your archive. Thanks, Josh. And you know, we know that Facebook does do some things like create shadow profiles. So even if you don't have a Facebook account anymore or you never had a Facebook account, they still may have that facial recognition information on a person that looks like you. It's just not tagged to your profile. Go ahead, Kerr. It may not be tagged to your profile because you don't have one, but it's tagged to your family members so that they know exactly who your relatives are and that sort of thing as well. So right. even if you don't have an account, Facebook knows you. Yeah. <sighs> oh, there was something else with that too. There was something where uh, Facebook was targeting some Android apps for people that were not on Facebook, but they had links through from family or friends or things like that. Whatever. There was a, I don't remember the article. I'll have to see if I can try to find it or whatever. There was an article about how Facebook was using trackers in other applications, wherever to go through and track people that specifically were not uh, Facebook users, um, trying to gather data on them and stuff as well. I think that was last week or two weeks ago that came out. I'll see if I can try to find that. But yeah, the, 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 the information that they're really trying to go through and uh, gather on users and non-users um, is, is pretty frightening. I know that there was, uh, there was a tool that – Firefox came out with called I think Lightbeam, yep, um, and it show you the graphical. You know, it was a it was a, a visual tool where we show all the trackers and uh, showed it where it point to in Google Analytics and Facebook were two of the top ones. Um, I think I gave that something of a talk, however, but yeah, they they were they're very very persistent in regards to their tracking and stuff. So it's it's out yeah. there. Uh, Ginsburg, I think Nico uh, pulled this up. Is that uh? Yep, that that's it. Yep. Look at that. Nico's got some OSINT skills. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's uh, awesome. Yeah. This is a registerer.co. Go ahead. Yeah. The, the title is Facebook Admits to Tracking Non-Users. Uh, this is a good read. Um, cool. Yeah. So it, it's, it's funny that they are expanding their claws outside of their own ecosystem, which, I mean, makes sense because they're – their business model is information. They sell your information. They want to sell ad space. They want to know what they can tailor towards you. So even if you're not part of their direct ecosystem, their secondary tracking, uh, advertising, and uh, other applications, you know, because they own a ton of stuff. I mean, Instagram, uh, what else do they own? WhatsApp. Think, what, WhatsApp? Mm-hmm. Yeah, some some of the other yeah bigger ones, whatever as well. So you know they're they're kind of like Walmart. Just because they're not called Walmart outside of the U.S. doesn't mean they're not there. You know, so Kirby, I'm just wondering when when the threshold happens that we start actually paying for our social network, and if you know you can get the masses on that to kind of avoid this. So you're saying instead of going in with a free model that it where you are the product and, and mm-hmm. all your connections are the product to, hey, if I pay for a uh, social media platform, I expect that you don't mar- use my data for marketing. Exactly. Like, so when, when when's the point when we start doing that? I think to me it'd be worthwhile paying for it. I mean, it, you'd have to have the masses on there, though, because there's got that, you know, that network effect. Yeah. So well, I'll tell you the nightmare. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Well, Mike. I was going to say, if each person sends me fifty dollars, I will start. And well, let's start a Kickstarter. Yeah. So, so, so this this is the nightmare scenario, whatever that I I believe will actually probably end up happening is not when do we get to pay for social media, uh, you know, applications or networks and stuff like that. When will social media start paying you? to use their software and stuff. And I think this is actually going to start happening. This is more than just the promoted posts and this is more than the um, influencers and things like that or whatever. This is for the day-to-day mom and dad. This is the kids, whatever, all that stuff. When do they go through and start cutting you a check, even if it's a stipend of $25 a month or something like that, just to go be able to use and license your information or whatever and sell ads to you or stuff. I feel like there's going to be Something is going to come down, maybe through GD or the uh, Privacy Act and stuff like that. But when do they start paying you so that they have like every legal right to go through and reproduce your information? So I think I would I think- love for that to be the case, where they have to pay you or they have to at least get your express permission for every single use that they use of your data. I think I think that's something that will happen. 
because then they'll still they'll still be able to go through and use your information, but they they will they will slide out of it saying, oh well, you know, we now own this because we're in a contract with you. We paid you this amount of money, whatever it'll be. You know, whatever. I think it'll be one of those things. Yeah. So while we're talking about information that's out there on the internet in Ginsburg, you were you found this uh, passport stuff on. Well, you didn't find it. You found this tweet to. Uh, oh, no, I found it. I found <laughs> 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 uh, so this goes back to a lot of the conversation we're having, you know, from the question came up with Jay to, you know, Kirby's talking about social or uh, search engine optimization, stuff like that. Um, Google dorks, um, you know, I kind of a little history about it kind of, you know, it got popularized by, was it Johnny Long, uh, the no tech hacker uh, way back in the day. Um, and it's still an amazing resource. Um, so what? Uh, I commit felonies did on here was he was just playing around and stuff uh, with, you know, Google Dorks and you can see it on there in the screen. You know, it's the end title colon index of forward slash, you know, and that's in quotations and then in URL uh, colon passport. And the thing that I love about Google Dorks and about Google hacking, whatever you want to call it, whatever, is that, you know, you can do these um, search for documents, you know, in, you know, entitled PDF. But a lot of people don't know that you can string these together to go through and do, you know, in URL, uh, company name dot com minus company name to go through and iterate all the subdomains. Um, you can go through and get so much stuff. I, it's it, it is a wealth of information. I was going to ask in regards to this though, to the people on on the the webcast, where do you use Google Dorks during your OSINT investigations? I feel like uh, Google Dorks is more of a spray and pray type thing. You can definitely aim it at certain websites and you can aim it at certain personalities and stuff like that, but it does seem kind of scattershot. So as much fun as this is to go through and maybe get a baseline for, you know, something you're looking at, do people specifically on here, whatever, do, do you guys use Google Dorks at all? I use them all the time. I don't think nice. of them as scattershot, but you, you just have to formulate them. You know, yeah. so um, maybe at some point we just have some, uh, a webcast just on our favorite Google Dorks. But even next week when I talk about RSS for your ego, ego searches, Google Dorks is the way we get all of these ego searches. Okay, yeah, and, cool. And do not forget uh, Bing Dorks, Yandex Dorks, whatever Dorks, whatever search engine you can basically dork it. DuckDuckGo, they got a lot of their own Dorks. They're yeah. bangs. Bangs, yeah. But I, I don't like bang well anyway yes yeah i still use them <laughs> sector oh no i just yell up bangs um i also post a link uh, have a look as uh, tomorrow and the newsletter is also going to be in there really nice and nifty overview of uh, lots of um yeah standard search operators it's just a little cheat sheet so yeah no, I still, I still think it's a very, very powerful tool set, uh, and it is something that you can spend a lot of time on, and you know you can you can get very good at. But there's always, I mean, if you look at, I think it is exploitdb.com. That's the exploit database. That's where a lot of the Google um, hacks, uh, Google one-liner kind of things, were started yeah. to live. Yeah. The Google Hacking Database. So yes. Johnny Long in the community created the Google Hacking Database uh, year, years ago in the two, early 2000s, and then it's now hosted on exploit-db.com. And uh, the Google Hacking Database uh, consists of Google dorks that people have qualified and quantified to pull up everything from webcams that are online to other things. Now, again, I want to just throw out this warning that just because you find something on the internet does not mean that it's it's okay to type in usernames and passwords and to mm -hmm. access those resources. And be warned also that there are people out there that are bad people that know that people search for things like uh, extension or file type colon XLS space um, password. And, you know, you find a password uh, uh, filed with, with passwords and you open it up and it says, hey, to reveal these passwords, just run this macro. And now your system's compromised. So yep. be careful when, you, when you're doing this stuff. Kirby. 
Yeah, be careful when you do any of the really popular, like hacker thinking Google dorks. The one that really gets me uh, that I think is hilarious is the video. The ones who you're looking for a webcam, especially the really popular ones for the webcam, and all of a sudden you find all the porn bots, and those also often have quite a bit of malware. So. I will say also, um, and this kind of goes back to one of the first stories we covered where the, the lady had her picture being used um, in <clears throat> promotional material or whatever that T-line guy, whatever it was. Um, there are a lot of um, professional photography people that use like um, WordPress specifically, whatever, that, that have a wealth of information on there. And there has been a lot of... Um, you know, kind of either sock accounts or other, I don't want to say nefarious or whatever, but definitely not in line with the person's wishes, uh, but, you know, misadvertisement of them. You know, it's, it's, it's with Google Dorse, it's very easy to go through and find, you know, um, JPEGs and, uh, and other images and things like that or whatever, and then use those for malicious things or whatever. Um, even some of the, um, I don't want to say ransomware, but there's there's a there's a growing trend in OSINT to just use information that you find online or whatever as a ransomware kind of attack. Uh, they especially with the they had like the uh, oh Ashton Madison things like that or whatever. If you were in one of those dumps, someone was going to try to bend you over for you know a hundred two hundred thousand dollars something like that or whatever. Well, it's going past that and. Just finding, you know, compromising photos or professional photos, whatever, um, can can also lead to those type of same things. So just be aware that that, that stuff is on there, and you should you should you should definitely talk to the people who are going to take your information. You know, be it like wedding photographers or you know, if you're getting headshots for something, make sure that you understand what they're going to go through and do, and what security they have lined up to protect your stuff, because there are just a ton of those on there, wherever. And, and if somebody's using your face to go through and do something else with, um, and considering it's the same thing we talked about kind of last week with DNA, you know, you don't own the rights to your DNA when they find something like that. Same thing with your images. Since um, the photographer is the professional that is out there taking the pictures, you don't own that picture anymore because it's their livelihood. Um, you know, it could be you and you're releasing that license to them to be used on their website. But then if their, their website's compromised and your, you know, your photos start showing up either on porn sites or other things like that or whatever, it, it, it's something where, where you just want to make sure that you're trying to protect as much as your, um, your personal identity as possible. Rant over. Wow. Yeah. Well done. Well done, Ginsburg. So, uh, Nico? Yeah, uh, I wanted to talk about the Beck International uh, Slack channel. Um, this was pointed out to me by someone. Um, the Twitter account, I Heart, I Heart Malware, um, is Ronnie T on this Medium post. So, they started the Beck International Slack channel. It's based on business email uh, related fraud. And it was a um, group who started with a little over 100 people and they grew to 600 members and they received several awards and were at conferences to stop this romance scams and malware mails and that kind of stuff but now they've got this huge huge slack group of uh, people all over the world trying and helping out to contribute to stopping this kind of business email fraud and i thought it was a really cool initiative just to join when you, I think everybody hates this kind of rubbish in his mail. So if you can contribute just by being in the channel, they have a channel um, in there asking for, hey, do you, know, do you know someone with experience who can talk to me from that and that company? And they will contact you. So it could be interesting if you're researching some kind of malware or you want to contribute to this kind of stuff. It should be interesting if you're receiving some kind of phishing mails you never heard of. This is a channel with lots and lots of experience about this and it involves a little bit of OSINT also. So I thought it was really cool to put it in here. Cool. Thanks. All right. So uh, 
We covered a lot of different topics today, and I will, as always, go ahead and put those in uh, the in a blog post and paste it on our site so that people can check out what we're talking about on here. And you can have the links to this at OSINT, C-U-R-I-O dot U-S, OSINT Curious. And I guess we're kind of at the end of our podcast here. Does anybody have anything else they want to talk about before we go around the horn one time? All right, let's go ahead and go around the horn one more time and just, uh, if you have anything, shout out or just say goodbyes. Let's start with uh, the last one to join. The first one that has perished on the actual blog post, Josh, on the actual podcast, Josh Huff. Thank you, thank you. Uh, nothing else to talk about. Um, uh, glad to be able to join this. It seems like we're gonna have a nice little uh, setup going here and I, I feel like we're gonna be able to have a, a Facebook Hall of Shame segment almost every week, the way things are going. So um, if you guys want to get a hold of me, you can hit me at Beowulf88 on Twitter, and I have a blog at learnallthethings.net. So I will see you guys next time. Cool. Thanks, Josh. Kirby? Yeah, and um, nothing more to add, I don't think, for this week, but I think that uh, I'll second the, we'll have the Facebook Hall of Shame going on as well. Um, you can get hold of me at Curbster on Twitter, uh, again, at pluses.net, and that's it. Thanks. Cool. Let's go to our our last on the phone person, Sector. Yeah, nothing else to add. Um, keep your eyes peeled for tomorrow's uh, week in OSINT, because tomorrow is Monday again. Uh, Sector 035 from Twitter and Medium. Until next time. Yeah, I always look forward to that. And, and that might be something that we start uh, looking at here too, Sector, is just, you know, highlights from your week in review. Because, I mean, you're already doing a week in review. So uh, uh, picking some of those things and, and talking about on here, really relevant. And thanks for doing that too. Nico? No, nothing to add this week. Just thank you. And you can all reach me by finding me on the internet, Dutch underscore Rosen guy. Cool. Thanks, buddy. Ginsburg. Um, yeah, you can find me on Twitter, Ginsburg5150. Um, I do have a blog post that's supposed to be coming out on OSINT Curious tomorrow, so we'll see if I set that up the right way. Um, we'll see how that works. Um, there's some conferences and stuff coming up. I'll post on Twitter that I'll be attending. Uh, besides KC, I'm doing the OSINT Village out there, so if you're in the Kansas City or Missouri area, if you're somewhere around there, whatever, let me know. Um, yeah, that's pretty much about it. Um, OSINT.team, uh, go hit that up if you guys have any questions or if there's somewhere else, you know, outside of us that you want to ask questions to. It's a pretty good resource as well, but yeah. Uh, also, I'm, I'm super stoked to be on this. This is uh, an amazing webcast, podcast, amazing group of people. I really, really enjoy being able to go through and talk with other like-minded OSINT people, and they let me rant. So this is a, a real big uh, honor for me, so I appreciate it. And Ginsburg doesn't know this, but this is his last week with OSIN Curious. Thank you, Git. No, no, no. I'm just playing with you. <laughs> we I was can't have you like, like hey, because, because your audio and your video, we can't have you on anymore. Yeah, that's not going to happen. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, Ginsburg. And awesome. I'm your host for this week. My name is Michael Hoffman. I go by Web Preacher. You can hit me up all over the internet. Um, if you are in the. Um, in the OSIN field and you want to get some more information, we've got a wonderful OSIN summit that's coming up in Alexandria, Virginia in February, sponsored by SANS. It'll be a day's worth of content. I believe Beowulf, uh, Josh is speaking, Kirby is the keynote. We've got a whole bunch of people that are coming to that that are going to uh, really share a lot of information. So if you're interested in that, it's the OSINT Summit at SANS. You can always hit me up for more information. And until next week, uh, I'd like to thank you for listening. Thank you for watching and uh, have a great week. Have a great week. <laughs>